Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining session two. We are a minute early, so I'll let everybody come in. If you weren't part of session one or you'd just like to say hello again, go ahead and uh, put your name, your school name, and your county in the chat so we can welcome you. Thanks for joining early. We'll get started in just a few moments. Welcome, Erin. Good to see you. We're really looking forward to having our teachers learn about this resource today. Welcome Polk County, Orange County, Broward County, Hillsboro, Miami-Dade. We have some trainers here. Hey, Erin, how are you? Pasco County, Palm Beach County, some great representation already. Great to see some of our champion schools here represented, Lake Stevens, Sunset Park, Ritchie Elementary. Thanks everyone for joining. We'll just get started in just a moment. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started because we have a lot to share with you today. Really excited about this session for you here. Um, thanks for joining us for session two. This is Explore Everglades Habitats through Swamped in the Glades board game. In this session, you'll go on an, a watershed adventure through the Everglades and learn more about a fun interactive resource for the classroom that you can later request to bring back to your school or bring back to your classroom. I love the chat. The chat's going great. So some standard webinar guidelines. You will hear these throughout uh, the entire symposium. If you have any questions or feedback, go ahead and put them in the chat. We are monitoring them and we're going to do our best to answer as many questions as we can throughout the presentation and at the end as well. Uh, we are using polls in this session. They will be anonymous. And please note that all of our webinars will be recorded so that they can later be posted to the website. So. We ask you to share your excitement with us on social media. You see some social media handles for the Everglades Foundation on the screen. Make sure you're following us, tagging us, and using hashtags Everglades Literacy. Get your feet wet and take the first step. We love to go through social media and see what teachers have posted. So we are definitely looking. We encourage you to, do, uh, to post as much as you like about this symposium this year. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bianca Casuto. I am the Education Program Manager at the Everglades Foundation. I am based in Miami, Florida, but I've met many of you throughout the state, either virtually or face-to-face, -face, and I'm so glad that you're joining us here in this session. I'm also joined by Rebecca Wood. She's an environmental educator, and she's the creator of the Swamped in the Everglades board game and an artist as well. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Rebecca, go ahead and say a couple words to our mm -hmm. uh, excited group of teachers here today. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm super excited to be here. As Bianca said, I'm an environmental educator in Miami. I've worked over the past decade for a handful of different organizations, as well as independently as an informal educator. And for years now, I've been working on developing this board game about the Everglades that's designed to be a supplemental learning tool in the classroom for teachers to use when teaching about the Everglades. Over the last year, I've been able to get a large number of the games printed. So I'm really excited now to get this tool into the hands of teachers and excited to use this session as a way to give you all a little glimpse of the game, kind of talk about how and why it can be used in the classrooms, and then um, to show how directly it's connected to teaching about the specific ecosystems in the Everglades. Great. I'm so excited and I'm presenting, so I can't wait for the teachers to see it. <laughs> Before we dive a little bit deeper into the board game, I do want to go over some really important Everglades information that you as a teacher needs to know as well as your students. So many of you have participated in a teacher training before and you might be familiar with this, but the Everglades is incredibly important to us here in our state of Florida. It has so much value both in what it provides to us as uh, people who live in Florida, as well as this intrinsic value just for existing and being a beautiful landscape that we have here in Florida. The Everglades is the largest subtropical wetland in the United States. It's an incredibly diverse ecosystem with different habitats and home to over 2000 plant or animal species. The Everglades is defined and connected by water 
if you know our program, you know that it's always all about the water and incredibly important to bring it back to protecting that water. That's because 42% of Floridians or about 9 million people um, get their drinking water from the Biscayne, the Biscayne Aquifer in the Everglades. So that's a lot of us that rely on this natural resource for something that we use every single day to survive. And of course, fresh water is not just important to us and to the wildlife, but to other industries like tourism, recreation, real estate, and everything in between. So we are gonna launch a, po a poll question for you before we get started. And let me go ahead and do that now. Hmm. All right, let's just go ahead and answer these. There they go, <laughs> there the polls go. So the, there's two questions to this poll question here. What is a watershed? And why is the Everglades nicknamed the River of Grass? I'll give you all a moment to answer these questions. They are anonymous, so please answer freely. And then we'll go over the answers and why you need to know this information. So you have a couple options. What is a watershed? A facility that filters drinking water, an area of land where all of the water drains into the same body of water, an event marking a turning point in a course of action, or a shed where water is kept. And then why is the Everglades nicknamed the River of Grass? Because it provides habitat for different species that eat grasses. Not sure, the, is the Everglades even a river? Because it is dominated by vast stretches of sawgrass with slow flowing water, or I didn't know it was nicknamed the River of Grass, which is totally okay too. So we have some really good participation here. We'll just give it another moment and then we can close out the poll and share the results with you all. All right, we're at about 85%. I'm gonna end the poll and launch the results. So an overwhelming majority of you answered correctly that a watershed is an area of land where all of the water drains into the same body of water. And the Everglades is nicknamed the river of grass because it is dominated by vast stretches of sawgrass with slow flowing water. Some of you may also have heard the word paheyoki before. That's an incredibly important word in, in terms of Everglades education. It is a seminal word that means grassy waters. So a big theme is that a lot of grass, a lot of water, and a lot of area to explore. Let's show a, his, a picture of what the historic map of the Everglades looks like. The historic Everglades begins just south of Orlando in Shingle Creek near Kissimmee. If you see the blue outline on the screen, that is the outline of the historic Everglades ecosystem. That The water in the rainy season would flow from the Kissimmee chain of lakes down through the Kissimmee River and ultimately flow into Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee would fill up with all that fresh water and would overflow its southern brim into a wide, slow-moving river. Eventually, that fresh water would make its way down to the southern part of the state, at the southern part of the Everglades, Florida Bay. And this is the KOE watershed. K is for Everglades, K is for Kissimmee, O is for Lake Okeechobee, and E is for Everglades. And we wanted to remind you of this because this game that you're going to learn about today heavily discusses the historic flow of the water in the Everglades ecosystem. So take a look at all of these beautiful pictures that you see on the screen. The Everglades is in our backyards. So if you live within that blue outline on the map on the previous slide, you are living within the Everglades ecosystem and relying on it. Here on the screen, you can see just how diverse the ecosystem is in general. The Everglades has dry habitats, wet habitats. We have fresh water, salt water, brackish water, which is a mixture of both. The Everglades has been deemed a UNESCO International Biosphere Reserve, as well as a World Heritage Site. And it's an incredibly cool and fun place to go and explore. You can go kayaking, hiking, camping, you can take pictures, you can take um, an airboat ride. There's a lot of fun activities to do in the Everglades. And the board game touches on all of these ecosystems that you see on the screen here. We can't not talk about the beautiful animals, the wonderful animals that live in the Everglades. The Everglades is one of the most biodiverse regions in the entire world. The National Park was actually the first to be established in order to protect its flora and fauna, which is a really neat fun fact to bring back to the classroom. 
in the Everglades, you have some endemic species, meaning that they are only found in that location. An example of that is the critically endangered Florida panther. There are over 70 threatened or endangered species that call the Everglades home, and many of our lessons and other Everglades resources can help you teach that to your students in the classroom as well. And another fun fact that we always like to share is that the Everglades is the only place in the entire world where you can find both al alligators and crocodiles living within the same ecosystem. So I'm gonna pass it off to Rebecca and she's gonna guide us a little bit further on why board games are important in the classroom and then show us a preview of how to play. Exactly. <clears throat> so a lot of people say to me like, wow, this board game is so great. You should get it in summer camps, use it in after school programs. It'd be great for grandparents to play with their grandkids, which I think is all true. Those are all true facts, but I really see it as a learning tool in the classroom. I see that it has a place in the classroom. For several different reasons, board games combine visual, auditory, and kinesthetic or tactile learning modalities. They're exciting and give extra motivation to participate in classroom lessons. They offer a way to connect to a place or experience without actually being there. And then many studies have shown that exercising the brain through board games can have huge and reverberating effects. Um, so years of study and research has showed us that people learn in all kinds of different ways and that offering as many different learning modalities to students or to any learners is, um, will, will end up with more effective results in their ability to learn and take in information. All board games combine visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learning modalities. This one specifically is really um, visually engaging. The, the board is very colorful and has a lot to look at. The, the students spend a lot of time just looking at the board, the board and taking it all, <clears throat> sorry, and taking it all in. And then you're also, they're visually looking at the cards. So they're reading the words and seeing them in that way. Um, and then they're reading the cards out loud. So it's also giving auditory learners a chance to hear the, um, what's happening in the game. And then kinesthetically speaking, they are physically moving a piece of um, a playing piece through the game. And the whole game is about movement and flow and seeing patterns, right? So it's all kinesthetic. Additionally, there's actually a couple of cards or a couple of ways that you can add movement into the game. Some of the cards um, incorporate movement. For instance, if there's a card about an Atala butterfly, it might say flutter forward one space. And if you want to, you can have your students actually flutter forward or flutter around the room or take a spin around the room, however you want to do it, to add that kinesthetic aspect to the learning experience. Um, it's a hands-on engaging resource for the classroom. Students dive into the sights and sounds of exploring that ecosystem. <clears throat> Board games are really exciting and give extra motivation to participate in the lesson. Students are placed in the center of the action and um, they're motivated by the prospect of winning or um, just getting to another ecosystem to read the cards, to really take in the information and to answer questions thoughtfully. It provides an extended learning opportunity that brings excitement and adventure to the classroom. Studies show, of course, that the more excited you are, the more engaged you are, the more you're gonna learn. Um, and students use all kinds of skills, team building, cooperative problem solving, critical thinking, and more while they're playing the game. We have a really neat clip of some students playing it in the classroom that we're excited to, to play for you here. You flow to the most wild and magical parts of the Everglades. Enter an ecosystem of your choice to explore and enjoy. Yay! Okay, you know what? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, Okay, this so that gives you just a little sense of the excitement <clears throat> that can come. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, while playing the game. Um, so board games offer a way to connect to a place or experience without actually being there. 
students and actually all of us really need a personal connection to the material at hand to be able to take it in and integrate it into their knowledge base. In the case of the Everglades, you know, I think the most effective way to build that personal connection is to bring them to the Everglades, to have them experience the um, feeling, the sounds, the sights, the smells of being in the middle of a cypress dome. However, that is not accessible or available to everyone or all the time. So I see this board game as kind of like a next best option to play the game students are being asked to visualize themselves as a drop of water and experience everything that might happen to a drop of water in each ecosystem. So it's almost as if they are there themselves. It's kind of a next best option. Um, this board game reinforces learning by connecting classroom learning with real world environmental issues. It involves um, a lot of current issues that are happening right now. It involves a lot of discussion around human impact to the Everglades. Um, with students having the ability to explore the environment, they can take the perspective of plants and wildlife in the habitat, bringing in a new viewpoint to their critical thinking, right? They're experiencing this game not as a human. They're experiencing it as a drop of water and as the plants and the animals that they're interacting with as that drop of water. So it's a really different way of thinking about it. Um, and of course, again, this learning resource can be used to fill the gap of missed field trips or other place-based educational activity. I love this slide because you have an insert picture of what the Cypress Dome habitat looks like from the board game overlaid over an actual picture of the Cypress Dome from the Everglades. And then we have pictures of some of our students taking a field trip out into the Cypress Dome. So we're just trying to share that there are so many connections that you can make when implementing this board game in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then many studies have shown that exercising the brain through playing board games can have huge and reverber reverberating effects. In one study, researchers found that playing board games twice a week increased the brain speed scores of elementary school students by 27 to 32%. Um, when you're playing board games, you're using the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex of your brain. Those parts of your brain are responsible for memory formation and complex thought, right? So if you are, um, if students are having increased brain speed, memory formation and complex thought, that's not just affecting their ability to win a board game, it's actually helping them succeed in all areas of school or giving them more um, potential to succeed in all areas of school. Um, and then all board games have a strong focus on social emotional learning skills. They teach players how to take, their, take turns, wait for each other, read directions, follow directions, negotiate with each other. They teach them how to win and lose graciously, right? Which is a skill that not everybody has, even adults. Um, and then they act, it teaches them how to support each other as well. It's pretty cool. Um, even though the game is a competitive game, it's not a cooperative game. You really see the kids supporting each other through it. They want to see each other succeed because then they get to find out more of what happens in the game. So they really help each other answer questions, which I tell them is fine, right? Because they're still learning that way. Um, they help each other figure out where they should go next or, or what they should do in different situations. So it's pretty awesome. Um, and then it helps them connect to nature and foster empathy and environmental stu stewardship for the ecosystems highlighted in the game. And then how to use Swamped in the Glades in the classroom, right? So again, I said, um, a lot of people think it should it should be in an after school program or a summer camp. I think that those are kind of spaces where it feels easier to incorporate games into um, the schedule for the day. Um, and again, I really feel that it's a tool to be used in the classroom. So there's two, two different ways that we see it being used in the classroom. Oh, great. <laughs> We're going to give you a glimpse of the game first, of course. So to play the game, you become a drop of water traveling through the Everglades. You start out at the top of the board in Lake Okeechobee, and each player, as that drop of water, slowly makes their way through six different ecosystems through the board. And in each ecosystem, they experience everything that might happen to a drop of water along the way before eventually making it to the Gulf of Mexico, where they win the game, hopefully. In the game, there um, are six different ecosystems highlighted and over 100 native species of plants and animals that are highlighted through illustrations or scenarios on the cards. 
There are 60 different question cards in the game that feature vocabulary and comprehension checks. And then there's a set of ecosystem cards for each ecosystem, which give different scenarios that involve water and how water moves in that ecosystem. Again, players start out in Lake Okeechobee and their mission is to make it to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and they do that by becoming a drop of water, traveling through the different ecosystems. This game is a card driven game. So it's, it's really simple. All you do is read the directions on the card and they tell you what to do. So players draw the cards and move that way from ecosystem to ecosystem. So let's say we're beginning our adventure as a drop of water in Lake Okeechobee. The players are going to start by drawing a Lake Okeechobee card, which will tell players to move forward into the Sawgrass Prairie or travel to another ecosystem, or they may get diverted to a city or the sugarcane fields or something else. Um, so some examples of those cards are popping up right on the side of the screen. Um, the first example, there's been even less rain than usual this dry season. The aquifers cannot, cannot supply the cities with enough drinking water. So the cities must use water from Lake Okeechobee, travel to the city. Once you get to the city, something else happens to you. You have to follow the directions and see what happens. We're not gonna give it all away right now. Um, another Lake Okeechobee card, rainfall in Florida is much lower than average this year. So Lake Okeechobee does not overflow the sad truth of Lake Okeechobee. Sometimes water doesn't flow the way it's supposed to. Remain in Lake Okeechobee, draw another card on your next turn. Um, and so you're going to draw the cards and then we have a third card that shows how you can actually move to a different ecosystem. You evaporate from the lake and condense into the humid air of the Cypress Dome. Enter the Cypress Dome ecosystem. At that point, you, as a drop of water, would travel to the Cypress Dome ecosystem. When you enter the Cypress Dome ecosystem or any new ecosystem, you're going to collect a token from that ecosystem. Players must have tokens from all six ecosystems before they can go to the Gulf of Mexico. It's kind of like proof that they've been to every ecosystem. Um, if the player lands on a question space, they are gonna draw a question card um, and answer the question card. If they answer four question cards correctly, they can trade the cards and jump to an ecosystem of their choice. Before we make it to the Cypress Swamp, I just want to point out teachers, listen to all of the subjects and topics that we've already shared with just pointing out a couple of these of these cards. You have the wet season versus the dry season. You have drinking water supply, water cycles. So if you're teaching about rainfall and water moving around, look at all these great connections that have your students really travel like that, that drop of water that we've been focusing on this entire session. So we're going to make our way to the Cypress Swamp as Rebecca was sharing with us. Here we are, we've made it to the wonderful Cypress Swamp in the Everglades. This is a freshwater ecosystem. Uh, those are bald cypress trees that you can see in the pictures on the screen. Those bald cypress trees are so big, they can grow to be over 150 feet tall and some of them can live for hundreds of years. What's really neat is that you can see changes in the water levels by just looking at the bottom part of the tree. If it's the wet season, the water levels are higher. And if it's the dry season, the water levels are lower and you should be able to see the different levels of the water markings. So Bald cypress trees are the most flood tolerant of all Everglades tree species, and they are the most dominant in this ecosystem. And of course, they are adapted to grow in waterlogged soils. So teachers teaching about adaptations, here's a great example of a plant or a tree that you can talk about. The roots of the bald cypress produce these knees, and I will point them out in the mouse here. These are those knees that we're talking about. They can reach above the soil and the water and those knees scientists believe that they help stabilize the tree and allow the roots of the tree to breathe. You can see lots of epiphytes or air plants on the bald cypress trees as well. Uh, these are some examples of these are Spanish moss or bromeliads, orchids, plants and tree plants and other species that you and your students are familiar with. There's a really neat picture on the screen here that is a solution hole. A solution hole can support the roots of bald cypress trees or other aquatic plants and also provide refuge for animals. And there are many, there are a couple different solution hole cards that are part of the game as well. We don't have pictures of them on the screen, but the cypress swamp is home to the American alligator, the rosette spoonbill, the river otter. Some of our favorite Everglades species can all be found in this beautiful um, freshwater habitat that we have in the Everglades. 
So we've flowed from Lake Okeechobee. We've made it to the Cypress Swamp. Here are some questions, some question cards from the Cypress Swamp, and I'll pass it back to you, Rebecca. Yeah, so um, the question cards, again, there are 60 question cards that go with this game that all feature vocabulary or comprehension checks um, and science concepts. So the questions are designed to, um, the whole game is designed to be as self-directed as possible with as little teacher involvement as possible. So the question cards actually have the question and the answer on them. That way, if a student lands on a question space, they're going to draw the question card, but pass it to their neighbor. And they're not going to look at it themselves. And their neighbor is going to be the one to ask them the question. And then because they have the answer right there, they don't have to go to the teacher every three minutes to find out if the question, if the student got the question right or wrong. And they can kind of all discuss together if they think that the answer was right or wrong. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of examples of question cards that you might get. Uh, question, what does the word ecosystem mean? Answer, a community or system of organisms interacting with one another and with their environment. Question, why do some cypress trees grow in a dome? Answer, in the center of every cypress dome is a solution hole where water pools deeper and trees grow taller because they have more access to water. Trees get shorter as they grow further from the solution hole as they have less and less access to water, creating a real dome shape. It's very impressive if you've ever seen it. Um, and then we have a couple of questions here that we wanted to give you all a chance to answer. So um, I think you're just going to drop the answer in the chat if you know it. The first question is, what is the purpose of Cypress Knees? And the second question is, describe two ways in which people are dependent on the Everglades. We'll give you a moment in the chat to write out your answers, but we want to encourage you to think the way your students would think. So you can answer the way you think your students might answer as well. So <laughs> want to answer. A little hint is that I already went over the purpose of cypress knees in the previous slide. So let's see. Knees help to uh, the roots to breathe. Very good. Thanks, Donna. They help to stabilize the tree. Very good, Linda. Thank you. Can anyone share two ways or more that we are dependent on the Everglades? Drinking water, there we go. It's all about the water, right? That's a really important one there. Water and wildlife, filters water. Yeah, absolutely. The Everglades provides us with ecosystem services that are natural free services like water filtration and water storage. Very good. So I'm gonna pop up some of the answers here. We know that cypress knees help to allow the roots to breathe and to stabilize the tree. And then uh, the answer for the uh, describe two ways in which people are dependent on the Everglades lists a whole bunch of reasons that your students um, can use as their answer. And there's so much more that they can add as well. So the game does allow for a little bit uh, of an addition for to add on more information. Absolutely. And again, um, if one student was answering a question and the other student was looking at the answer, they could, um, if they weren't sure if, if the student had answered correctly or not, they'll discuss it all together as a team and kind of decide like, did that count or not? Does it have to be the exact wording or not? <laughs> um, and then I love that Bianca kind of gave away the answer to the first question because I tell the students before we play the game that if they actually pay attention to, um, to the cards that their classmates are reading and if they actually listen to everything that's being said, a lot of the answers to the questions are actually in the cards. So they can really, even if they've never learned something before, they can figure out the answers if they really pay attention often. Yeah, that's a good that's good information to plug. Thanks, Rebecca. So once we've uh, once we've explored the Cypress Swamp, we're going to move into another habitat here. We've made our way to the mangroves. So, so the little arrow is indicating this adventure that we're taking. We're flowing through the Everglades as this drop of water. So tell us a little bit more about ecosystem cards and what yeah. you can experience in the mangroves. Yeah, for sure. So the ecosystems card, so each ecosystem has its own set of cards and um, each card tells you something that might happen to a drop of water or some way that water interacts with the plants or animals or ecosystem as a whole. So you can kind of see there's a wide array of what could happen in the ecosystem um, and how the concept of water is being used in the cards. Um, during the rainy season, you flow away from the cypresses and into the brackish water of the mangrove ecosystem, enter the mangroves. Of course, you would get a token, which is very exciting when you enter the mangrove ecosystem. Um, 
the Everglades has the largest contiguous stand of protected mangrove forest in this hemisphere. Stay where you are for this turn as you float for miles before flowing into another ecosystem. So some cards tell you to go forward, some tell you to stay where you are. Sometimes you have to wait for um, scientists to come in and study something or clean up some water, something like that. Um, you provide water to the red mangroves with tall stilt-like legs or prop roots that hold the tree upright. The tricolored heron, little blue heron, and snowy egret, who often nest in mixed species colonies, nest in the branches of mangrove trees and use your water for feeding grounds. So by talking, using the water as kind of a conduit, we're um, learning a lot about different species that live in the Everglades. The plant species, we're learning that tricolored herons, blue herons, and, or sorry, little blue herons and snowy egrets all nest in the branches of mangroves. So kind of seeing what different species have in common with each other. Um, you provide water for the endangered green sea turtle to swim and drink from. So of course, learning about endangered species. And then um, there's a couple of special cards um, throughout the game, like the Swamped Wild card, which was highlighted in the video earlier that you all saw. You flow into the most wild and magical parts of the Everglades, enter an ecosystem of your choice to explore and play. Again, the more excited the kids are, the more they're gonna learn from it. So really getting them to um, visualize themselves as that drop of water and really try to like experience it as a magical place, a magical experience. I think really enhances and increases their ability to learn while playing it. And there are so many more ecosystems to, to keep exploring, right? So that wild card is sort of where we leave you now as, to bring it back to the classroom and keep it going, <laughs> and get, get it started and keep it going. And of course, getting your feet wet and taking that next step, right? That applies to you and to your students. So. <laughs> exactly. So the question is, how do you bring it to your classroom? Um, so I see Swamped being used in two different ways. If you have a classroom set, then you can take a whole day or take a whole um, lesson session, class period, um, <laughs> to set up several copies of the game around the room and have the entire class play at once. If the whole class plays together, the teacher can model the rules, go over expectations and alignments and things like that all together and that gives a chance for the students to ask, ask, ask questions, practice playing um, all together. Um, and a benefit for the students for the whole class playing is that they really build on each other's excitement. When one group of kids is playing in one quarter of the room, they're really engaged with the game, but they're also hearing what's happening on the other side of the room. They're hearing screams of excitement. They're hearing um, groans of despair, all kinds of things. And that helps get them more excited. Again, more excitement equals more engagement and more learning. Um, it can get chaotic and wild and loud when you have a whole classroom playing. And I know that that is not appropriate at all times, right? Um, so I think it's a great option, but another option is to use the game as a learning center. So if you have one copy of the game, you can still use it effectively. You can set up learning centers that you rotate your students through. Up to five students can play the game at a time, so it's a perfect size for a group to be rotating through. And again, it's designed to be as self-directed as possible um, so that you don't have to be running over there all the time and helping them navigate through it. So you can play Swamped in the classroom on many different, uh, for, based on many different other experiences or resources that you're bringing into the classroom. So as most of you are familiar with, we have 36 standards aligned uh, free Everglades lessons for you to implement in the classroom. So playing Swamped can be something that you do before or after implementing any of our lessons. If you have a field trip scheduled to the Everglades, you can absolutely play the game before or after that, as well as any sort of classroom presentation or videos that you're showing based on the Everglades. So this gives students a knowledge base to pull from when they're actually out there exploring the field. And of course, it just deepens their connection to the Everglades because they'll think, wow, I already played in the Cypress Swamp and I know what these are and what they look like and what their purpose is. So when they're out there, they're going to be able to make those connections. And that's an amazing thing to see as an educator. Of course, we want to make sure that teachers understand that this goes beyond science. You can absolutely play this across different disciplines. So of course, you can add reading and language arts components to this, math components. If you're teaching Florida history or maybe even making a strong connection to civics and protecting the Everglades, this is a great resource. 
and all of the topics that we've already covered align perfectly to our lessons as well as the board game. So anything with watershed, native species, invasive species, water cycle, and so much more, you have a lot of opportunities to implement this in the classroom. We're gonna talk about how you can get this for your classroom in just a minute. Rebecca, the chat is everybody's like, how do I get this? I need this right now. So we're almost there. <laughs> awesome. So um, we wanted to show a little bit of how, just so that you all can be clear that the game does align with a lot of the science standards that you all work with. Um, so on the left side of the screen is the standards that align, the science standards that align with the board game for third through eighth grade. As Bianca was saying, of course, there's tons of reading involved in this game. There's language arts standards. There's other types of standards um, or other subject areas that, that have standards aligned to it. Um, but I just focused on the science standards for, for this slide. And then I put a star by fourth and fifth grade. I saw someone in the chat ask, what age is this game for? So I designed the game for fourth and fifth graders. And I feel that it's the most effective with fourth and fifth graders but that it can really be played with any ages. The reason for that is that, um, as you all saw, it does involve a lot of reading. And I've found that fourth grade, I think, is where students are more likely across the board to be at a reading level to be able to smoothly play the game um, and also to have already become familiar with some of the vocabulary and science concepts that are discussed in the game. But they're young enough to really get into the magic of playing the game and really get deeply engaged. Older kids are a little bit less excited to be, um, or less likely to be as excited about the game. Um, but of course that, that doesn't have to be true. So I have played the game with pre-K kids up through adults and it really, um, I think you all know your kids better than we do. So whatever you think would work for your kids and however you want to present it, that's what's gonna make them, um, that's what's gonna make it a useful tool or not, right? So if you present it in a way or help adapt it to their level, then it's gonna be a useful tool. Um, but again, I designed it for fourth and fifth grade. And we have our lessons, as we've already mentioned, that align to the same standards that this board game does. So for those of you that are not familiar with our program and our curriculum, here's just a screenshot on the right as to what these lessons in fourth grade and fifth grade focus on. And this is pretty much the same standards that Rebecca has included on in this board game as well. Uh, we, like uh, Rebecca was saying, you know your class really well. And so if you have any questions on how to adapt this to a younger or older grade level, you can definitely reach out to Rebecca and she will be happy to talk to you about what that looks like for your classroom. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then, um, uh, some of you all have been asking how to get the game. Well, one way is by going to my website where I also have several other resources. So I wanna see this game being used effectively. And I know some, sometimes it can be helpful to have other resources to go along with it. So um, I have a few resources on my website currently, but I'm planning on creating and posting more that are designed for teachers to use. Um, right now I have a teacher walkthrough video that gives some pro tips for facilitating the game being played in the classroom as well as a short video series called Glimpse of the Glades that um, has me in each ecosystem talking about a few key points of the ecosystems and sometimes doing silly things in the ecosystems. Um, and I'll be adding to that as, as time goes on. So if you wanted to show your kids those videos or anything like that, use them in any way or just as inspiration, they're available to you. So for time's sake, I'm just going to get to the most important slide of this entire session here. And that is for, uh, oh, excuse me, we have one more before we get there. Yeah, so, so um, this. <laughs> yeah, so one more resource that I've created to help build on and emphasize knowledge um, and connections made while playing this game. Each game has a piece of paper that basically has a series of questions that are designed to, to help students continue thinking about and building on everything that they learned in the game. And sometimes even figuring out how to, how to like take action or incorporate this knowledge into their lifestyle, right? Um, so it could be used again as a self-directed tool to have students read the questions and answer some of the, some of the different questions or for teachers to kind of create lessons out of. Yeah, this is a great teacher takeaway, and we will share this in our, the resources for teachers in the follow-up. All right, take it away, Rebecca. Let us know how <laughs> can we get this in the classroom. Awesome. So, um, so 
Uh, as I said, I did get a large number of games printed um, over this last year, and I'm committed to having a certain number of those games go into Title I schools or under-resourced schools for free. So um, if you want a copy of the game or a classroom set of the game, you may be eligible for a free set. Um, and then, of course, I have games available for purchase as well. So um, we're asking that teachers, if you're interested in a game um, and especially interested in your eligibility to receive a free game, that you fill out um, this survey. The link is on this page, but I think it's in the chat as well and will go out in the follow up from the session. Um, and then you can contact me through email or by visiting my website. And just let me know and we'll talk more about purchasing a game or how to get the games to you. All right, I'm dropping that link in the chat. There we go. There's the request a game link. And again, Perfect. if you miss it during this session, it will be on our website. All right, so I think- um, Oh, and yes, I saw, I just see in the chat from um, Janine Fernandez, if you responded to the email already that if you're a champion school and you already responded to the survey, you don't have to respond again. I already have your information and we'll be contacting you um, in the next couple of weeks as the school year gets started to coordinate getting you games and things like that. Thanks for asking. Wonderful, so we have a couple minutes before we wrap up. I think there are a couple other questions in the chat that I think maybe it would benefit many teachers if you answered them. So one of them is about how much time would you allow for students to play the game all the way through? What's your experience with that? Um, I think allowing 45 minutes is, is a good amount of time. It can be shorter. I actually shortened it. <laughs> um, previously, in the previous version of the game, I would have said, 45 minutes on average, and now I would say 45 minutes tops. So it can be shorter than that. So I came up with a couple of different ways to shorten them because I do want you to be able to play it in one class period. Um, and it depends on how many kids are playing at once. If it's um, five kids, I would say 45 minute max, but it can be shorter. If it's two kids, they go really fast. So it kind of depends on how you're using it in the classroom. We've had a couple of teachers saying, how can I use this for my K2 students? And then we even had someone saying that they would like to adapt this for college age. So that's interesting. I really like that uh, spectrum. Yeah. Well, yeah, I love the, the college age question. I found from working as an environmental educator in general, and I'm sure that you all have seen this, um, probably experience this oftentimes you know, college students don't know that much more than elementary age students about a lot of these topics. So um, a lot of the information is new to them. So it's, it's, I designed it for fourth and fifth grade. It's challenging for them for sure, but it's challenging for adults as well. It's not just for elementary age kids. Um, and of course, challenging means they're learning. So it's good in that way. Um, K through two is a lot harder. It involves a lot more teacher engagement, obviously. Um, definitely incorporating movements into the game. So some of the cards, cards, as I said, have movements written in there. Um, so having them like maybe pulling out specific cards and kind of just having them act out different cards or things like that um, is a way. Um, playing with mixed age groups, if you have the opportunity ever to do that. I know some schools have uh, like buddy systems with where different ages K through two work with older elementary school kids. And I found mixed age group works really well because the older kids will help the younger kids read the cards and help them understand what's going on. Um, but really focusing on, on images and um, movements that are happening in the game is great for the younger kids. And as I develop more resources, I'll post those on my website or let you all know because um, I do want it to be accessible to anybody that wants to use it. Wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. We have another recommend recommendation here that students can then make their own new cards based on the content knowledge that they learn. So I, I really like yes. that extension and I think that would work really nicely for our excited and passionate students. So. Yes, yes, absolutely. So Definitely. before I wrap up and move on to our slides, I want to thank you, Rebecca, so much for taking the time to introduce this resource to teachers, allowing to align to our lessons, right? resources that already exist and resources that are easy to get into the classroom. So thank you so much. Let me make sure there is a, a, nothing in the chat. Maybe K, K through two teachers, each table could be a water droplet and do the game as teams with a teacher assistant playing along. Yeah, that's a great adaptation. 
And I wanna make it clear to everybody that Rebecca hand drew this board and it is absolutely beautiful. And so you got a lot of great comments in the chat just on your artistic work as well. And so I wanted to recognize that in case someone didn't know that. <laughs> awesome, thank you all so much. I really appreciate all the positive feedback. <laughs> thank you. I'm gonna drop the link again in the chat one more time on how to request the game. And don't worry if you miss it, you can go back to our website in a few days and you'll have access to that link there. Thanks, Rebecca, so much. Thank really you. So like all the other sessions, stay connected by visiting our website. Everything will be recorded and posted and you'll get an email about attending this session, including a certificate of completion, as well as information on requesting PD points from your school district. So. All right, hello everyone. I'm Kim Gooch and I'm here to announce our winner. We have another giveaway today. It's an exciting uh, Everglades Foundation swag bag. So the winner is... It's going. Drum roll. <laughs> awesome. So it is going to be Mary Beth uh, Letcher from Palmer Catholic Academy in St. John's County. So congratulations, Mary Beth. Uh, you'll receive an email from us shortly on how to collect your prize. So again, congratulations. Thanks for joining us. Uh, stick around for all of our other sessions. Uh, we will have more giveaways. And up next in about 15 minutes, we have session three, steaming through the Everglades as ecosystem engineers uh, with Lance Couture from the Museum of Discovery and Science and myself. Uh, we'll talk all about the engineering design process and sustainability projects. So we will see you all in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.